Welcome, welcome everyone to um, this conversation. Um, and I'm going to echo what Cindy mentioned. Um, it's really a conversation and discussion. Um, and we want everyone to feel welcome um, to have feedback and input and be part of it. So please feel free to use the chat or to, to use the reaction button to raise your virtual hand on the screen. And um, we'll just talk. Um, and as Sandy mentioned earlier, um, this was going to be the traditional presentation. Um, but in sight of uh, what happened at the Oscars recently, uh, we both thought it'd be appropriate to um, address that. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I think we should give a content warning uh, that we will be talking about ableism, oppression, racism, uh, violence, uh, toxicity. Um, so we just wanted to give you that heads up. Um, if for any reason you need to leave this space for a few minutes, please feel free to do so. If you're more comfortable with your camera off, that's perfectly fine. Lay down, sit up, um, eat, drink, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, we're just amongst ourselves for the next hour or so. We're going to talk. Right, Cindy? That's it. That's what we're going to do. And <laughs> Like Val said, you know, the Oscars just occurred and um, there were things about the Oscars that happened, um, particularly what we are going to talk about is um, the ableism that was on stage for all to see, but perhaps some have missed. And so Val, I'm going to turn that over to you. Okay. I thought you were going to ask me a question. So. I was, uh, but <laughs> you can see I got all, yeah. So, okay, so we'll, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about specifically the um, ableism. We'll just bring that up. Um, I think one of um, one of the most unique qualities of ableism is how subversive it is uh, to majority of people. So in the Oscars, um, when said comedian made a reference uh, to someone in the audience who who was had the hair loss because of a hair condition, um, most people did not view that as ableism. Um, I contend that that's where the conversation starts and ends right there. Uh, for me, what happened afterward, um, it's not a topic that I want to discuss, it's what happened for those three seconds and how we as a society have tended to okay that how we've excused um mocking disabled people uh being the butt end of a joke um being made fun of disregarded as oh it's just funny oh it's a comedian um and what we're doing is we're enabling uh an oppression um for what appears to many as, as just a little thing to even bigger things um, and I think that's where we wanted to kind of launch the conversation, so to speak. Yeah, we did. You know, um, I think that so often, as Val said, ableism is missed. We're not really sure what ableism is. How did we get here? <laughs> where did it start? And so one of the, you know, and what, what about this field of culture and what role does that play? So, so Val, if we can, um, just define ableism and 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 look at the aspects of of ableism that are beyond what somebody might think of sure. you know so often um, we know what racism is we know what these other isms are out there but there seems to be some confusion as to what is ableism and how do we acknowledge it yeah um yeah um, I, I, you know, let's take a bigger, broader perspective on ableism and give what most people know what it is. Um, you know, it's discrimination against dis disabled people or in favor of non-disabled people. Um, that's pretty much the, the Wikipedia definition of it. Um, but it's so much more than just discrimination. It, 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 ableism really sets the parameter of what is deemed normal and what is deemed accessible, uh, acceptable. Um, so we talk about physical access, obviously. 
um, you know, stairs was were created by non-disabled people. Um, obviously, because disabled people wouldn't create stairs. Um, lack of captioning. Um, you know, physical access barriers are the obvious ableist um, characteristics. Uh, we talk about programs and services. Uh, where hiring of disabled people is out there, uh, where um, arts by disabled people are not present. Um, but we also talk about more subversive things. So, for instance, at the Oscars, uh, the mocking of or joking of a disabled person, um, the disregard of a disabled person. Um, I think the fact that it's 2022 and we made such a huge deal about a deaf actor winning an award says a lot about where we are and where we need to get to. Um, that shouldn't be such a big deal this late in the game. It should be the norm. And that's where ableism plays a part. Um, you know, part of ableism is the whole um, inspiration point, right? So a lot of non disabled people were so happy about, you know, this film that won and, and the after that one, um, because it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And we need to ask ourselves, as disabled people, why? Uh, and what are we, why, why is it happening? And what are we contributing to this? Because we all contribute in a negative way to why this is happening. You know, what, what are we allowing in our spaces, in our circles, um, to allow this to perpetrate for so long? I think we had to challenge ourselves into seeing ableism for what it is. Uh, we had to recognize that it is violent, it is toxic, and it's assault. You know, and I think regardless of the disability type you have, you are experiencing ableism in, in many different forms. Yeah, I'm mute, Cindy. My dog. My dog was barking. I'm so oh, sorry. Okay. I'm really glad you brought in inspiration porn because that that is an issue that you know con continues to also go under the radar. Um, one of the things that I think that when you look at the reaction of the community um, to the whole Oscars as a whole, you know, um, we know that yes, there was the piece on. Um, recognizing um, CODA, Ryan, and the deaf actor. Um, we saw the beautiful support, natural support that Lady Gaga gave to Liza Minnelli, right? That's being talked about. And then we are talking about Chris Rock and, and um, Will Smith. And so when, when you look at that, there was all types of things about disability, right? That that might have gone under the radar. And, and so how do we bring this forward? How do we help a movement of becoming anti-ableist? And before you answer that question, can you give us some other examples, some lived experiences of ableism? Oh, wow. Well, I think for most right. disabled people, I think you wake up and you go to bed knowing that you're going to experience ableism on a day in and day out basis. So for me, as a person with a physical disability, it's, it's the obvious, right? It's the physical barriers. Um, but it's also when you dig deeper, it's, it's seeing uh, colleagues and coworkers um, utilize access and services that are not accessible. It's knowing that you're being um omitted from certain spaces because it's not accessible it's understanding that at any given moment you're going to confront any type of stereotypical comment behavior um waving at pointing at staring at situation and that's that is a 24 7 reality for many of us um and I think if it's not, if you're a disabled person and you're not recognizing that, then th that might be part of um, the link in the chain, the, the broken link in the chain. Um, I think it's our inability to recognize it sometimes um, doesn't, 
it, it continues to perpetuate you know the ism so so val you know mm -hmm. we talked about the physical barriers and the stereotypes and um the inspiration porn but what about ableist language we see ableist language on a frequent and consistent basis um and and can you you know i happen to know that there was a research document that showed the term special needs was an ineffective euphemism and in fact it actually harms instead of helps can you speak on that i can <laughs> um i'm very big <laughs> I'm very big on identity, identity first. So you'll never hear me say person with a disability. I'm a disabled person. Um, I, I will never use euphemisms like special needs, handy capable, um, anything like that. I, I think identity and language is so important um, because we set the tone of how we want to be addressed. Um, and because our community is so large and so diverse, unfortunately, we have many who are acceptable of those terms. Um, they are okay with special needs. They are okay with handicapped. They are okay with challenged. Um, and it's become where it's saying the word disabled or disability is frowned upon. Um, you know, and I think that narrative has to change. Now, whether or not you want to use identity first or people first, that's fine. I think everyone has an individual choice on how to identify. But I think when we start getting into euphemisms, I think that ends up being more harm, harmful than, than beneficial to all of us. I agree. I, um, I always think of, uh, you know, some of the terms you hear, special needs parent or my child has special needs. And to me, those terms really do nothing but other us, you know, and, and, and I don't think being termed a special needs parent really identifies us in any way. Um, we're not the one, well, maybe we are, but I mean, typically we're not the one with, with a disability, right? I mean, there are people out there who have a disability, who have children, and, and that's a whole nother topic we could <laughs> get caught up on an ableism right when children are yanked from their parents right out of the hospital but but I think that um, language you know shapes our thoughts and our actions and as long as we continue to use these harmful terms then not only are we shaping our own thoughts and actions and beliefs um, but I think we're shaping those of others and that's really what that report showed yeah. so I have, you know, at times people have asked, well, what other words would you use to, to describe a group of people? And of course I say, why are we describing a group? We're talking about individual people. Um, would you have a better remark about that? Um, a better comment? I think that's an appropriate remark. I mean, it depends on the situation. Um, you know, when, when the last president um, was in office, uh, there were many, um, especially on what is deemed, the, you know, the more progressive side that used their this language to describe them. Um, we use, and please excuse my, my language, we use the word crazy a lot. We use the word idiot a lot. Um, and regardless of where you use it to describe, it's wrong on all bases. Um, you know, I think sometimes we get caught up in political affiliations and think it's okay that I use ableism as a weapon because it's against the other person. When in fact, what you're doing is just perpetuating ableism and making it okay to be used. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you're pointing out that, you know, the use of language is so important um, and staying away from certain words or terms um, is needed. I agree. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when when we were going to do this as a presentation style, not a conversation, um, we we looked at internalized ableism, and a new term for me um, was lateral ableism. And can you describe the difference in the two? And um, go from there. Let's go from there. The yeah. difference in the two. I mean, 
internalized ableism, excuse me, internalized ableism um, is how we feel about ourselves. What, what do we feel about ourselves based on what we're told? So we begin to believe um, that we are not as worthy, uh, that we don't belong, uh, that we should be treated in a inhumane way or even a special way. Um, so we start buying into the hype is what I say. Um, so all, all the ableist language, behaviors, um, assaults that we take in day in and day out, we start taking it in ourselves. Um, and it's hard, it's hard not to. Um, and I talked to Cindy earlier, especially as a younger person, um, you're impressionable and you're going through early life happenings, um, you start questioning yourself. And when you're being uh, pointed out as what well, Cindy said earlier, othered, um, you start buying into that. Um, and that's where internalized ableism is real damaging um, because then we, we, we act that out. You know, we, we start limiting ourselves. We start um, just falling into this deep hole uh, that ableism created. Um, and when we talk about lateral ableism, then we start damaging our own community. Um, and that lateral ableism is basically ableism towards a member of our community. Um, and that typically happens when there's a difference in disability type. Um, so, you know, people with physical disabilities may have misconceptions about individuals in the IDD community. And because of that, um, there's separation. Um, there's conversations that happen without diverse of disability. Um, you know, there, there are disability powers that be that only have physical disabilities. So, you know, where are people with mental health disabilities, sensory disabilities, IDD community? Um, so what we end up doing, we end up going into our own groups. Um, we belong to the self-determination group. We belong to the Mental Health Alliance. We belong to the Polio Association. So when you do that, it's great because we receive the support and care that we need. It's also not great because now we're segregated. And now we only know our disability type. And now we have misconceptions about other disabilities. And now we don't include others uh, with other disabilities. So lateral ableism is, is I mean, we eat of our own, we destroy of our own. Um, and that's a product of, you know, the bigger, broader ableism. You know, we see this a lot. Um, I said earlier, you know, I'm a mom and I've been doing uh, disability work for 25 years. And, you know, one of the things uh, when I first started is you saw more of an inclusive community amongst ourselves. Um, sadly, um, I think we're seeing, you know, we're talking about inclusion, but yet we're building programs and services based on disability type. Like you said, we all join into these silos, if you will. Um, and one of the things that continues to worry me and concern me is that the lateral ableism that we are creating as children grow into adults, because we're saying, oh, come to the Down syndrome dance. You have to have Down syndrome to come to the dance or come to you know, this dance for people with dyslexia. I mean, not only are we um, having agencies divide into silos, but we're showing our children, right? right. That, that you, know, you can only play and have social hour with people who look like, act like you, if you will, these are the terms we hear, but, but you only can do this if you have Down syndrome, or you only can do this if you have autism. And so, you know, what are some things, um, when you look at the um, internalized ableism, how do you see that play out in the overall um, arching community? Do you think that that has impact? I think, and, and, and let me take a step back. I think it's very important to be in community. Um, and if you're in community with disability types that you identify with, it's extremely important. Um, 
we want to talk to somebody who can understand some of the nuances that we navigate through. Um, and I think the lack of community is what leads to lateral, I mean, internalized ableism. I think when we start buying into the, the poison of ableism, but yet we can't share that with others, I think that's where the internalization just stays internal. Um, I, I think if we're in community, a community could be three people, could be 300 people, um, but people that you can share with, talk to, you'll find out that there's so many common bonds that we have with one another. And the one common bond we have is that we've all been oppressed. We're, we've all been disregarded in some way, shape or form. We've all been othered. We've all been made fun of. We've all been the butt of the joke of, of a comedian or what have you. So we all understand what that feels like. And I think the need for coming together as a community is so important. Um, you, you mentioned inclusion, and, and I, I'm going to probably challenge the group with this, um, but I'm of the assertion um, from reading some very educated and talented people, um, our inclusion really is a, a toxic place. Um, we're asking to be included into a place, a space, a society that really doesn't want us there to begin with. Um, we're asking to be included into a space where our voice is of the minority. Um, so once we're there, what are we doing there? And how vital, how important are we going to be seen? Um, and that's just something to, that I'm evolving and learning on um, because I think instead of inclusion, we need to be talking about liberation. And part of liberation is being in community and learning from each other and growing with each other and providing for each other. Um, you know, it's one of the, you know, one of the big happenings in, in, in the disability movement was the 504 sit-ins. And I think um, despite all the other stuff that, that was not right about it, the one thing that I took from that was you had a variety of disability types helping each other for those 20 days or whatever it was. You had deaf people signing out the window to bring in supplies. You had people with physical disabilities that were more physically able to help someone who was not. You had nonverbal people giving, giving time to speak, you know, to have their words. If it took 30 minutes to say 10 words, they were given that. And I think we forget about that. And I think we forget about how our specific disability can be so influential in a group of everyone else's disability, um, if that makes sense. And I think that's the kind of community that we need to strive for and, and, and have access to. You know, I, I like the term liberation. You know, when I look at, you know, challenging the school district to include Carissa into classes and, and helping others who have these same desires, you know, it occurred to me one day that truly, um, perhaps while we, we like the idea of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act giving us rights, I think it's harmful. You know, when we are saying we're going to place students in the least restrictive environment, right? that to me itself speaks ableism. You, you don't belong here, so we might move you, you know? And so when you say liberation, I, I really like that term. And, and I think that's truly what we're speaking of is, is well, liberation. We can, so. we, can always, we, can always, we can also add the ADA to that. If you look at language of the ADA, what does it say? Reasonable accommodation. Um, on, if it doesn't cause undue hardship, um, it has a language that speaks about monetary so if it doesn't cost so much we could look into this um it, it's a minimum standards law so even if we're oh we're covered by the ada but look at what we're covered by it, it, it you know ableism is a, is a product of capitalism and the ada is very dri money driven and very pro-business um if a business can show 
If they cannot afford to put a ramp in the front door, they don't have to. It's plain and simple. Um, so, you know, that's when we spoke earlier about recognizing what ableism is, it's that. It's even the things that are deemed to protect us, you kind of have to question how are they protecting us? And what are they mm -hmm. protecting us from and giving us access to? And once they have access to that, then what? Yeah. I think that that that's true. And I, you know, I've heard that about the ADA before. And you know, our lived experience was with more so access being let us in, let us in, right? right. Um, let us actually in the class, right? Or let us attend, you know, be at the workforce or what have you. Um, you know, when you when you talk about um, the internalized ableism, can you talk about the harms that have come from that? Um, for me personally, or just in general? Anybody you know, either way? Yeah. That's hard because I think each, every disabled person has some level, some degree of internalized ableism, regardless of your age or the place that you're at. Um, you know, I, I share it with Cindy, you know, I grew up in a space where I had no disabled friends. I went to college, I had one disabled friend. Um, when I got my first real job serving the disability community, that was my first experience in being in a space and I was almost 30 years old. Um, you know, I was very much brought up of uh, the mindset of, you can do anything, you can overcome in spite of. Um, so, it, you know, it's, obviously this is a different time. So when you buy into that and as you progress, you realize, I realize how much community I missed out on. You know, how much conversation, um, interaction that I missed out on because I did not consider myself disabled. Which is so silly because I have so many obvious disabilities. Um, but that's, that's internalized ableism. I mean, and even if it doesn't do us harm in that way, then we miss out. I think we, we forget you know, the, the beauty of, you know, I call it the beauty of brokenness. You know, we forget what that looks like. We don't get to experience that. And for me, as an older person, I can do that now. You know, I can, I can appreciate that now more so. Um, but that, that's, that's a process. You know, everybody's going to evolve differently at a different time. And so talk to me about the impact of inspiration porn, not only to a person with a disability, but to our community as a whole. And that aspect um, of it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think inspiration porn um, objectifies us. We're seen as objects um, that inspire, not because we did this great thing, just because we live with a disability and we're out and about or we got a job or we went to school. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the Oscars, I almost try to stick with the Oscar conversation. Um, you know, Liza Minnelli and Coda, um, you know, you and I know that though those moments gave everybody the warm and fuzzies. Not because Liza Minnelli is a great actress or anything, because she was in a chair and she got to use a ramp. She was given this award. You can see the, the still photos where people are, are you know, are leaning down and, and kind of like, oh, you poor little precious thing. And you could just, you, you could just, and I didn't watch the Oscars, but you know that people were so inspired by this, you know, and Coda winning and, and the deaf actor. And, oh my God, they're using ASL. That's so beautiful. Those, those things should not be identified like that. We should see that as when we see, hear somebody speaking Spanish, when we hear a different language, when we see someone of a different color. I mean, it should not be um, where people are so inspired um, because someone lives with a disability and now, um, now, they can, now they feel better about themselves, um, so to speak. So now, now disabled people then, Wow, that's so great. If they can do it, I can do it. I feel so much better about myself. Or at least I'm not down. 
you know. And, and I think that's what, but unfortunately, it's, it's an offshoot of, of ableism. So, so Val, uh, you know, if we would have took um, Chris Rock and had him to be a Caucasian person oh. and what happened that night, we would have called that racism. Yeah. Why is it, do you think that we don't recognize ableism? Is it because we haven't called it out enough? Is it because it's commonly used? I mean, why is it that we don't seem to recognize that? So, so many reasons, I think. Um, I just think ableism is so embedded in our society and so accepted um, that it's just enabled and, and disregarded and blown off. Um, I, I don't think, and I think our own community, we need to do a better job at recognizing it. And we need to do, and we need, what well, we thought we need to do it is labeling it for what it is as toxic assault violence. Because that's what it is. Um, it, yeah. It's no less and no yeah, more sure. than, all the, than all the other isms, you know, with racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, misogyny, xenophobia, ableism, all of those should be wrapped into one. Uh, but for some reason, ableism is one of those that's the accepted one. Um, right. And I think, you know, I, I will point the finger in the mirror and say our community has to do a better job at setting the tone for that. Um, and I think because we are so large and fragmented that there are too many voices that are okay with that. There are too many voices that will excuse Chris Rock. Um, you know, the whole conversation was, uh, you know, I, I don't, when we talk about the Oscars, I never say the Will Smith situation. I say the Chris Rock situation. Yes. Because I, I will never condone violence. But if you are going to condone violence, then you have to start with the, the violence that started, which is the ableism. And that's where, that's where the disconnect is. No one is seeing ableism as violence. You know, no one's seeing ableism as this oppression that, that literally kills people. You know, airlines that break wheelchairs um, for people who need them to especially sit in a way and cannot have died of pressure sores. You know, medical settings, um, people die there. Um, so our community literally dies at the hand of ableism. And to think that so many of us are okay with that or brush it off as a haha -ha or a joke, or uh, I think it's, it speaks highly on us. And I, and I hate to be a hard ass on us, but I think we need to like take, a, take stock within ourselves and say, okay, what am I doing to contribute to this? And what can I do not to do that anymore? You know, so often people will say just about language, I'm just gonna throw that out there, but it's just words, it's just yeah. words. Well, you know, like I think I said earlier, maybe when you and I were talking is words shape our actions, our thoughts, our beliefs, everything we do. And, you know, um, the self-determination group um, held our third annual disability day of mourning event where you have um, people who were killed by filicide by family members who didn't see the value um, yeah. in their stories. And then we see reporters who, you know, they'll write about what happened, but the, the victim becomes the person who murdered the others, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, so when we talk about ableism as killing people, we aren't just saying that to have something to say. Right. It is literally occurring. It is violent. Right. It is oppressive. It is literally killing people, right? And, and so, you know, I think now, um, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about is, when you and I were talking is, you know, what can we do? You know, how can we address it? And, you know, of course, somebody wrote in a chat and I didn't get to see the whole thing, but about commenting every time this has occurred or something. And, and I think that, yeah, it does take a little bit of time to write a comment or make a phone call or send mm -hmm. a brochure or something to the people who continue 
to be in the limelight, right? Our reporters, our our comedians, our different people who stand up um, and use these things and think it's okay. Um, but we need to educate them. But what else? What else can we do? So we ourselves, right, mm -hmm. need to first off recognize our own ableism and. And sometimes Val and I'll have a conversation and I'll say, I know I said that word, I'm sorry, because I say it and I don't mean it and I recognize it, but I recognize it and I try to do better. But I think that there has to be more. What what are some things we can do um, to start turning the page, to, yeah. to start getting others to see that these aren't just words, these aren't just actions, you're literally killing us. Yeah. And I think um, before I answer that, now's a good time. It's if you have questions or thoughts and you want to uh, put your hand up, um, we can we can dialogue with that. Um, I, I think that the, the one answer for that is lifestyle. I think we have to develop a lifestyle of the anti-ableist. Um, I mentioned earlier how ableism is an offshoot of capitalism and how money drives so much of what we do. And if you look at other movements, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, women's rights movement. There's so much, um, there's so many influential people with influential dollars that impacted those changes. And I think you know, one of the key elements that we are missing is that, is having the influential individual with a disability who can actually make an impact with money. Um, I, I think having a lifestyle of not going to the inaccessible store, if you're non disabled people is not going to the museum uh, that does not feature disabled artists. Um, it is um, writing letters, it is, you know, boycotting uh, those institutions. Because as long as people are entering spaces that are not open to disabled people, they will continue to remain that way. You know, as long as services are being used that do not highlight disabled people, they will continue to be that way. Um, you know, as, as large as we are, 25% of the country, but still only 25%. Um, businesses and services will survive with 75% of the country pouring money into them. So, you know, we need to start asking ourselves, where are we spending our dollars? Where are we spending our time? Where are we spending our support? Um, what political candidate am I supporting? And why are they not um, including disabled platforms? Uh, why are they not hiring uh, disabled aid or volunteers? Um, it's all these little things that it, it becomes a lifestyle. And I know it's harder, it would be more of a challenge for a non-disabled person to adapt to this, but that's what it's going to take. Um, I, I think using the term ally, I think we need to throw that out the window. I think ally is very passive. Um, I think an ally is somebody that will show up to a rally, hold the sign, take a picture, and then go home. Um, it, it's more than that. It has to be a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly effort to consciously um, abolish ableism. And that's for all of us. So Val, when I look at, um, you know, um, I hate to say this term, but the disability community, when you look at the disability community, um, some of the people who have the greatest um, ability at loss are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. When you talk about ableism for people with IDD, um, it is far greater, I think, than access. It is value. It is um, expectation. It's it's everything. But yet they are uh, the largest group of people, at least in my experience, who don't have a voice, who are not listened to, who are not heard, and sometimes not even given the equipment or opportunity, as you said, like with um, the film Crip Camp, um, to speak up. What can we do to, to change that? 
I mean, yeah, what can we do? What what can we have what can we do? That that that's a more on us on our community issue. Um, because we don't do that. We we're, we create spaces and tables where these decisions, decisions are made and conversations are had without everyone. Um, because again, we're familiar with our disability type. We're familiar with who we know. Um, but as long as we continue to do that, we're going to continue to separate from each other. Um, and, and as you mentioned, my experience in working with the IDD community, one of the most passionate vocal groups that I work with. You know, I enjoy working with you and the self determination group because they're going to show up. You know, and they're passionate yeah. about what they do. There's no agenda. There's no politicization of it. There's none of that. It's just a, a natural passion to fight injustices. And I think if we can't recognize that in in subgroups in our own community, that's a problem. You know, that's a that's a problem. We have to start. You know, when you occupy space, start look at, start taking note and look around and see who's here and who's not here. You know, if you belong to a disability group or disability space, ask yourself who's here and who's not here. Even a virtual space. You know, if it's a virtual space that only includes a certain type of disabled person, start, start asking that question. Why aren't we including others? Because until we do that, this is going to be an ongoing issue. I agree. I have uh, one other question, and then I do want to, Val has opened it up to anybody who would like to speak. But, you know, Val, one of the things we hear, particularly for young children, where we're just starting, is that everything they do, you know, their goals, their objectives, they're going to do it independently, right? Mm -hmm. Da, 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 independently. And, you know, we, I have people tell me my kid can't um, live outside of a group home because they can't independently do whatever. And, and I, it is my belief that none of us are independent, um, that we all have interdependence. And, and can you speak about um, that part of ableism? When we hold people with disabilities to higher standards than we do people without disabilities? By higher standards, I'm going to guess that. I, I think it's almost, in a way, it's almost the opposite. I don't think the non-disabled world has any standards for us. I, I, I don't think we're expected to do anything because anything we do is so inspiring. It's so grandiose. Um, so I think it's it, maybe not standard, but it's that we had to do so much more just to be at a place where a non-disabled person is. Uh, we had to put in so much more effort, so much more time. Uh, there needs to be more connections uh, just to get to a place where, and, and of course the generalization, but if you consider managing your disability type, managing any type of supports on medication, managing anything about your disability, just to go to work, just to go to school, just to be a functional person of the day. Um, that in itself, you know, we have that much more labor that we have to embark on. So I, I think, you know, one of the things I'm learning to do and, and learning to, to teach is self-care and self-love and giving yourself grace. Um, you know, as, as much of a hard ass I am and as, as vocal as I speak, I also know that I give myself a lot of grace and I want to give people around me a lot of grace because we do, you know, and, and, and we, when you live in a society that doesn't really give that to us, we have to give that to each other. Yeah, and, and that's the important thing. Nobody wants to be in a community where we're all curmudgeons and we're tired all the time and we just can't get things done. Sometimes we just want to be loved on and say, you know what, it's okay. We'll deal with this tomorrow. You know, I, I think that's one of the things that we need to learn 
to do as well. Well, thank you. Um, Val, I know we talked about many things as we prepared for this, this, <laughs> this session um, and our discussion tonight. Did I miss anything? Um, no, I think so. Okay. I mean, we have an hour. I want to make sure that, that people have a chance to ask questions that they have or join in the yeah. conversation or maybe even bring up a, a related topic that we haven't. Very good. Uh, Michelle, do we have any questions in the chat? No. I think she's saying no. Yeah, no. Okay. Well, if everybody wants to unmute and and if you have questions for Val um, or just comments about tonight's discussion, please share it with us. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed or learned and um, feel inspired or empowered, I should say, to go out and make change um, whatever way you can. But um, anybody, anybody want to share? I share Jamie. No. No. Okay. Did did uh, Amy I jump? Right. Oh, right. No. I was looking for Amy. She had had some comments in chat, but I couldn't focus on them. Um, and I just I don't hear, know if she had something. I hear her voice across the house, so she must have received a phone call or something. Okay. No worries. No, so I apologize. Okay. Oh, no apologies needed. I just wanted to make okay. sure that if she was here. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Cindy, I think I, I, I'll echo what we talked about earlier. I mean, okay. We need to create more of these. Um, just space to talk, space to learn and grow and, and nurture community. Um, I, I think we get so used to, even in the virtual world where it's for this purpose only, and we're just doing this and only two people are talking, and then you go home you, or you log off. I, I think we need to create more interactive space um especially for the community yes I, I i can agree i think you know the more we can discuss and the more we can continue the dialogue the better chances of creating change will occur so i see a hand up jen did you have jen. a hand up was just applauding the idea of having more conversations around this because I think that's that's so needed even within our community. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank You're welcome. You. Thank you. Yeah. And as Thank part you. of being in community, I mean the 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 reality of the pandemic, mm. you know, it's the it's the virtual world. And mm. um I, I think being able to log in at any time with a group of people at some point. Yeah. I see another mm. hand up. Linda. Mm. I um, I just read that Amy put dear ableism in the chat. Um, it's letters she writes to ableism about what, you know what's right and what's wrong, mm -hmm. and um, her friend Michael writes them too, and then they perform them at um, CTD has like this poetry slam on weekends. It's virtual, so anyway, I'm sure that if anybody else wanted to write a dear ableism letter, they would welcome. Um, Y'all joining their little dear ableism Facebook page. Thank so, anyways. Okay. Thank you. I don't know where we went. Linda, um, will you ask Amy to send me a link or something that um, I can look into that further? I think uh, I think it's in the oh, chat. Did you see it, Cindy? I have not been watching the chat because I'm trying to focus. Okay. Um, yeah. I, Do you know how to save the chat? At the, do you know how to save the chat at the end, guys? You just, at the bottom of the chat on the right are three little okay, dots yeah. and you click on them and you can save your chat. Okay, very good. I will save it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Paige, did you have something you wanted to add? I think these are good um, because it offers community and especially in the time of the pandemic, I think that's especially important. Um, also, you know, me being a disabled veteran, my, bag of disabilities um, might not be someone else's so it helps me mm -hmm. learn as well and I'm sure you know other people um you know a terms that I might be comfortable with other people aren't comfortable mm -hmm. with or I might, I might not know better so it gives me a space to learn as well um so I think you know these are really great and I hope they continue well thank you, thank you and Paige how did you hear about tonight's session uh Val 
<laughs> there is something to be said about distributing through um, social media, right? <laughs> I know, I'm assuming that, but I, I don't know. But um, thank you for being with us tonight. Anybody else have anything they want to say before we close for this evening? Yes. I sorry, I don't know how to even raise my hand on this jump thing. Um, is this going to be up on Facebook or anywhere soon? Are you going to publish? Are you going to have this um, recording <laughs> up? I would like to share this with a number of my teacher family and friends. Sure. So yes, Val gave us permission to record and I will put it up. I will be very honest. Um, I, from the time I learned how to do it to now, it's been about six months. So it might take me a couple of days or so to get it up. But once it is up, I will post it on the, um, the self-determination group Facebook page. Okay. We also have a um, YouTube channel that it will be on. That's where it will be housed. And okay. Val and I have talked about, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Look Ahead conference series, um, but uh, it's a quarterly conference series. It's a mini series. Um, it happens um, February, May, August, and November. And um, in, from May, August, or November, Val and I are going to do this again. We think it's important. Um, and he has agreed to do that with us. So anyhow, um, so yes, yes, the answer is yes. And yes, it will be something we will be doing again. It's important. So anybody else? Uh, Heather. Heather okay, Heather. Thank you. Um, yeah, first off, thank you, Val. I always love hearing your perspective. And uh, I always learn a lot. Um, I So I uh, am learning how to do research and uh, adapted physical activity. And so I noticed a not surprising, but really horrible trend of um, what senior researchers in my field that want to do physical activity Hi. interventions with people with disabilities without including uh, uh, people with IDD or autism specifically. Uh, um, and that they just wanna immerse themselves in those communities and tell people what they need without asking them or doing any kind of research uh, first uh, on their perspective. So I guess I'd be really interested in hearing ways you think it, that we could combat that because it's like it's running rampant and in, in my field and i bet that's happening all over the place in research so uh, I, I think without without being an expert in that field i would say to um challenge it i, I think is to redefine what disability actually is um, I, I think if it's a space designed for individuals with disabilities, but yet the powers that be are designating this as a only certain type of disability, then it's time to you know, teach what disability is and, and what disability types are, and that there are people with IDD and autism and mental health disabilities, and on and on and on. Um, and, and I think challenging that is probably the best way to start. And as a researcher, um, I'm sure you could come up with a more eloquent way of presenting that. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's so many spaces um, that I can't even think of that are so designated just for a certain group of people. You know? And on our end, we kind of okay with that. But yeah, it's, you know, it's usually implemented by, you know, the non-disabled world. So Heather, um, there's a gentleman in the disability uh, field who also lives with a disability. His name is Norman Kuntz. And he talks about what you're talking about. Norman has a cerebral palsy and he talks about how <laughs> He, he doesn't call his physical therapist a physical therapist. He called them physical terrorists. 
<laughs> truth, truth. And, and he has many biases, but he might be a really good person for you to connect with. He is available online. He is out of Canada. Um, and, and he is a, he is a very, um, he's very articulate in his beliefs and the things he has learned and about how people with disabilities are treated. Um, he also is married to a person with disabilities and I just don't know her, ex her experience in that area, but she may have something to add as well. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I think you would like connecting with Norman. So. Anybody else? No? Well, thank you again for everybody who joined us tonight. Val, always thank you for your wisdom you. and life experiences and willingness to share those and your determination to make this world a better place for some people. Um, anyway, thank you all. And I hope you have a good evening. If you enjoyed this, please let us know. If you have other topics of interest, we would also entertain those in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank I'm going you. to I'm gonna save the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Michelle was changing it, was saving it as well. Okay. Uh, she said no. <laughs> oh, she said no. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me hold on, Val. Uh huh. See I'm not right now. Save chat. I just saved it. Yay! Go send it. So how does it serve? Where does it go to? I found it. Hold on just a second. Uh -huh. I'll call you back. So okay. when you save it, where does it go to? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to find out because Linda knows. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been saved, so that's all that matters. <laughs> I've never saved the chat, so. Yeah, no, yeah. that's all good. So hold on just a second. That went okay. So I think it did go okay. Yeah. I was just a little more interactive. It could have been more interactive, but I, I think, yeah. That's you okay. Know, um, I want to apologize in the front. It threw me. My whole screen went blank. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so I did. I, you may have changed the view. Because there's like a view button on the upper right where you uh -huh. can see everybody or just see the speaker. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I don't know. It just, it went away, like all gone. I hadn't touched anything. And then it came back. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm so, that threw me completely. Oh, I need to stop the recording. That'll be nice.